Did North Korea just up the ante in this nuclear showdown? Welcome, everyone. I am Trish Regan in for Neil Cavuto, and this is your world. The Washington Post just reporting North Korea has produced a miniature nuclear warhead that can fit inside a missile and may have more bombs than anyone thought. The president just warning North Korea any new threats will be met with, quote, fire and fury like the world has never seen. Lucas Tomlinson is at the Pentagon with the latest for us. Hi, Lucas. Well, hey, Trish. Japanese officials are confirming the details of the Washington Post report. The Pentagon is not commenting, but the results are pretty startling. Now, North Korea has demonstrated the ability to miniaturize a nuclear warhead, according to this report, but it still must do two things to successfully launch an intercontinental missile and hit the United States. One, it must demonstrate the ability to hit a target, and two, it must demonstrate the ability to have a reentry vehicle get back from space down into Earth. So far, it hasn't done that. Now, let's just recap the last two intercontinental ballistic missile tests from North Korea. The first one on July 4th traveled 1,700 miles into space. It was in the air for 39 minutes. Then, weeks later, on July 28th, North Korea launched a second intercontinental ballistic missile that traveled 2,300 miles into space and was in the air for 45 minutes. It was the longest and farthest ballistic missile test in the history of the rogue communist regime. But cameras in Japan picked up that rear entry vehicle, Trish, and it was on fire when it re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. So there's still questions about North Korea's capability, but clearly this report today from the Washington Post shows that North Korea is accelerating uh, its missile program. It's noteworthy that a top U.S. Air Force general echoed much of this report in October of 2015 when he said that North Korea does have the ability to miniaturize a nuclear warhead. Now, this all comes as the Pentagon is ramping up its efforts to be able to shoot down those types of missiles. But what's noteworthy is President Trump's budget for this year actually cuts missile defense. Now, top Republican leaders on Capitol Hill, including House Armed Services Committee Chairman Mac Thornberry, has inserted language into the defense budget that will increase uh, missile defense. But it's also noteworthy the results of the recent testing are actually missed, mixed. In late May, the U.S. Missile Defense Agency successfully shot down a test intercontinental ballistic missile in space after an interceptor missile was launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. It deployed a kill vehicle and successfully shot down that missile. But just a month later in June, an interceptor missile launched from the USS John Paul Jones, a U.S. warship in the Pacific, missed its target, which raises questions about what comes next. Trish? Thank you very much, Lucas. All right, you know, we finally got China to sign on to those sanctions against North Korea, but is it all just too little too late? Gordon Chang is author of Nuclear Showdown, North Korea Takes on the World. Good to have you here, um, especially on a day like today, Gordon. First of all, let's talk about what North Korea is actually capable of doing, because people are making the point that they don't quite have the technology to actually guide one of these missiles right towards a, a major city in the United States. But you've also said that doesn't necessarily matter. Yes, well, you know, if you're trying to destroy a missile silo, which we try to do and which the Chinese do, you need to be accurate within feet. But if you're just trying to terrorize a population, it doesn't matter whether you're off a few miles. And the North Koreans just want to terrorize us. So, uh, you know, yes, they do need to work on their guidance, but nonetheless, I don't think that that's significant at this particular time. They do have questions about heat shielding. There are disagreements about how successful this last test was on the heat shield. But the North Koreans probably have already had a successful heat shield test. They're well on their way to being able to bring back a weapon from space. So so they're making accelerated progress, you know, within months, maybe a year outside. They're going to be able to hold us to terror. Uh, hold us to terror? I mean, in, in what way? Walk me through that. They're going to say, look, if you don't do this, you're yeah. running the risk that you've got a, a nuclear warhead heading towards Los Angeles? Yeah. I'm not worried that Kim Jong-un, the North Korean ruler, is going to wake up one morning and say, I want to lob a missile at L.A. or New York. But what I am concerned is that when he is confident in his arsenal, he's going to try to use it for blackmail, like Vladimir Putin did in August 2014 against the Baltics. And what I'm concerned about Kim doing is trying to break the alliance between South Korea and the United States, 
get our 28,500 service personnel off the peninsula, and then try to destroy the South Korean state, which is at the core of the legitimacy of the North Korean regime, which is to rule all of Korea. So that's going to start a chain of events where we're going to be involved, the Japanese are going to be involved, and certainly the Chinese are going to have a say in what goes on. Well, this is going but, to get... But we can't let it get to that state, right? I mean, there's got to... We, we've, we've enacted sanctions. Russia and China, theoretically signing up for that one, although we, we haven't really seen the Chinese follow through before in terms of their ability to really work on those sanctions with North Korea. But, it, it, I mean, how are we allowing it to get to the point where they could hit L.A. or New York? Can't we do something in between? Well, there's a lot that we can do, but American administrations, which have basically failed to deal with this over the course of decades, and they failed for a number of reasons. First of all, sort of dismissing North Korea. But also, you know, we have seen um, presidents really put the integration of China into the international system above disarming North Korea. And because of that, the North Koreans have been able to make a lot of progress as we tried to please the Chinese and keep them happy. This has really been a mistake of, uh, I think, historic importance. But nonetheless, we're at a point where we have not, uh, and this is going to be history looking back at us and saying, how could you let this happen? But we have not been willing to use all the elements of American power to protect the American people. Meaning because we don't want casualties. We don't well, want anyone getting hurt. Well, but because we've had other priorities. You know, we've looked at other things. You know, we were involved in the Middle East. We were much more concerned about the Iranian nuclear okay, weapons Okay, so we had program. bigger problems, bigger issues. This one is allowed to, to, to fester and is now at a point where we have to do something about it. I guess, Gordon, my question is, what do we do about it? Well, I think one of the things we do is, is we start to impose costs on China that are so severe that they have no choice but to help us. We have not... So really, this is a showdown with China. This is very much a showdown with China because we're not really worried about North Korea in a sense. You know, they cannot stand up to the international community if they didn't have backing. They have backing from Beijing from all sorts of things, from economics, to diplomacy, to all sorts of things that the Chinese supply to the North Korean regime yep. to give it the confidence mm -hmm. to stand up to the United States. If the Chinese weren't doing that, we would have solved this a long time ago. Well, this will be a big test for this administration for sure. Uh, this will be Donald their first Trump crisis. Has promised that he would not allow them to get this capability to actually hit us, and so uh, he's going to have to make a lot of decisions, I would think, uh, him and his team in the next few days. Anyway, Gordon Chang, good to see you. Thank you so much. Uh, we got stocks losing ground here, uh, down 33 after the report that North Korea may have nuclear ready warheads, but no major sell off, even as the news hit. So, why don't the market a little more? by something like this. Fox Business Network's Charlie Gasparino joins me now. And Charlie, again, I'd point out we did see a little bit of sell-off, but, you know, when you hear headlines like this, you anticipate a whole lot more. Yeah, but, you know, when you talk to big-time investors, sophisticated investors, they, they sit there and they tell you, listen, we just don't think that North Korea in of itself is going to be, you know, uh, an existential threat to the U.S. economy. And, uh, I mean, that's where it is. Now, maybe... Maybe they're, they're underplaying it or underestimating uh, Kim Jong-un's uh, ability to cause havoc and to, and to uh, wreak terror in the US, for the U.S. to, uh, to har harm our, our trading partners like Japan and, right. and South Korea. I mean, obviously, South Korea would not fare well if in, a, in a nuclear war with North Korea. And, uh, you know, and that would definitely have an, imp an economic impact. But you just right now, at this point, the, the, Everything the else is looking good, the, right? And, and, yeah, and, and you want right. to ride it as long as you can. I mean, and, it, it, you got a market that continually, you know, we missed it today, right. but we were going for 10 straight days in a row of record trades. Right, and as you know, markets trade off of headlines, and, the, and today's headline with North Korea was a good time to take some profits, obviously. So, But my point, my bigger point is the markets don't see North Korea as an existential threat, at least right now. Uh, now, the question is, are they underestimating it? Or not, or do they have it? Do they have it just right that you know, if we have to, we'll just wipe them off the face of the earth. I mean, you hear investors talk about this all the time, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you know, we'll just take them out, and that, and that'll be that. They have no way to really impact our economy. I, I kind of think they're underestimating it because if. But you know, it's bigger than that, right? Though because it's China. I mean, well, it, as Gordon and China, I were just discussing, it, it, it's not just North Korea you're talking about here. You've got to get China well, that's their, on board, and that's they don't their, want to play ball. They're invested in, in seeing this kind of chaos well, and, and strife. Well, yeah, not necessarily. Korea. I mean, they, I don't believe that. I, I mean, listen, right now they're invested in making sure the U.S. 
does not have do not control the Korean Peninsula. I get mm -hmm. that. That's that's why they back up North Korea. It's why they have historically. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know, they also are invested invested in the U.S. I mean, they hold our treasuries. They we there's a lot of business that they do mm -hmm. with us. There's an economic rationale for mm -hmm. them. To be uh, not not to not to have North Korea go right. off the but they, skids, but they may want to push it to a certain extent. I mean, as Gordon said, it's to their advantage if they get us out of there entirely, and and if we start to treat North Korea like a rational player and and are but scared enough of them but it's that we not, back out. But listen, we'll just see, we'll, we're gonna have to see how it goes. I don't I don't know. I'm not inside the mind of the Chinese leadership right now, but I will tell you. Just common sense. It's in their, and you can ask Gordon this, it's okay. in their economic interest for us not to have a nuclear war with North Korea. It is in their economic interest. Hey, Charlie. They know it, and we know it. Good to see you. Thank you very much. All right. Well, he was Homeland Security Secretary General John Kelly. So, Neil, when a country has a deliverable nuke, it changes the equation. So now that he's chief of staff, how can we expect the Trump administration to act on this latest threat? And in wake of new revelations surrounding former Attorney General Loretta Lynch, calls are growing louder for a special prosecutor into her actions. Republican Congressman Jim Jordan leading the charge, and he's here. The markets are always moving. We'll update you on these markets still soaring. Wall Street is into it. Not for Russia. This. Bill Clinton's tarmac meeting. I remember that one with former Attorney General Loretta Lynch. This after a slew of emails came out. Uh, we're going right now to Congressman Jim Jordan, who is calling for a special prosecutor for all of this. Uh, but first, Kristen Fisher is in Washington, D.C. with the very latest. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Trish. Well, this is all coming from the American Center for Law and Justice, a group led by one of the president's personal attorneys. You know, it's been digging for documents related to that now infamous meeting on the tarmac between former Attorney General Loretta Lynch and former President Bill Clinton during the campaign. And it found through a Freedom of Information Act request that Lynch had been using an email alias for official emails, including emails related to that very meeting. Now, it's not totally uncommon for cabinet secretaries to use an email alias. Lynch's predecessor, Eric Holder, used one. So did former IRS official Lois Lerner. It's also not illegal, but it does make it more difficult for attorneys and reporters who are trying to get government documents through Freedom of Information Act requests. You could have a situation where the attorney general conducts emails in secret using this fake address. And then when someone puts in a freedom of information request and says, I want the attorney general's email correspondence, the person who handles that request may not know about the secret account. Now, the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee and his Republican colleagues had already sent a letter to the attorney general's office urging it to investigate, quote, the American public has a right to know the facts, all of them, surrounding the election and its aftermath. We urge you to appoint a second special counsel to ensure these troubling unanswered questions are not relegated to the dustbin of history. And so this latest revelation will only add even more fuel and even more urgency to that request, Trish. Hey, right, Kristen Fisher, thank you very much. Let's get reaction right now from Ohio Republican Congressman Jim Jordan, a member of the House Judiciary Committee. Good to have you here, Congressman. Uh, Good to be with you. You, see, you actually like to see a, a special prosecutor in this. You don't. You yes. don't like the idea that Loretta Lynch was out there using an email that wasn't actually her. Well, right. If if you're just talking about golf, you're just talking about your grandkids. Why do you need to use a pseudonym uh, and a special email account? Uh, it's interesting, Trish, that the meeting took place with former President Clinton the day before the Benghazi Select Committee report was due to come out, two days before Secretary Clinton is to be interviewed by the FBI, and we're all supposed to believe it's just coincidence, it just happened, and all they talked about again was golf and grandkids. I, I mean, no one buys that. What, uh, that, to me, is a concern, and that's why we've called for a special counsel to look into this. As a, and a host of other issues surrounding Mr. Comey and Ms. Mm -hmm. Lynch. Congressman, there, there are some people that feel like, okay, this, this is yesterday's news. In other words, she didn't win. Uh, Donald Trump is now president. Let's move on. And it, it, even Donald Trump himself seemed to, to sound like he didn't want to go after Hillary Clinton it, once he had taken office. Um, but now we're in a situation where they're going after him. And it, with the, the whole special investigation, and, and it kind of feels like, in some ways, this might be more appropriate given the level of uh, vitriol they have directed at him. 
No, it's it, it's not it's not yesterday's news. It's the fact that there's equal treatment under the law, and that was not the, not what Secretary Clinton got. She got special treatment. She got different standards than what I would get. Second, based on Mr. Comey's testimony a few weeks back, where he indicated at the direction of the United States Attorney General, he then, the FBI director, mm -hmm. went out and misled the American people when he called the investigation a matter and not an investigation. As mm -hmm. I said in committee 10 days ago, the last time I checked, he wasn't director of the Federal Bureau of Matters. He's the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. So why call it something different? Mm -hmm. Why would the Attorney General instruct the FBI director to mislead the American people? And why would she meet with the president, former president, just days before the secretary is supposed to be interviewed by the FBI? I think the answer is obvious. They wanted Clinton, the Justice Department, the Obama Justice Department, wanted Clinton to win the election. Remember, this all happens in the larger So it's context, a different kind of collusion, of perhaps. You know, it, Congressman, it, it seems like there are a lot of questions here, a whole lot of questions. And as much as people would like to move on, you know, for the health of the country and you got a new president and Hillary Clinton is in the past, I right. hear you in that this kind of stuff cannot be allowed. And so there are there are questions that need to be answered and there are things that need to be addressed. Of course. Um, in the terms Justice of Department, what's that? Yeah, the Justice Department should not be in the habit of misleading the American public. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what they did. And you have to ask the question why. And it seems to me when you ask the question why, it's obvious they were trying to help Clinton win. Yeah, it, it, Congressman, I, I, I do have to hand it to her on the on the alias, though. Elizabeth Carlisle has a kind of nice <laughs> ring to it. <laughs> does make it harder for journalists, though, when you're trying to get those emails from Loretta of Lynch, because it turns out you can get all the Loretta Lynch you want, but um, you're going to not get the Elizabeth Carlisle. Uh, yeah. Let me turn to North Korea with you. Obviously, very big story today out of the Washington yeah. Post. What are, what are we going to do here? I mean, this has gotten to the point where we're going to need to do something. And, Congressman, I don't know with all those sanctions, even with China on board, are ever going to yeah. work. No, I mean, you know, we, we applaud the, the Trump administration and Ambassador Haley for the work that they did on the sanctions. I think that is, is certainly uh, the, the right direction to move. Um, I know the, the Trump administration is trying to work with China to exert more pressure on North Korea uh, in, in that, that part of the world. But this is serious. I know the White House and, and our foreign policy experts are taking it for the very serious matter that it is. Um, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But let's let's hope that um, this this individual, a uh, golly, who runs, who runs North Korea, um, can, can tone it down a little bit, and, and um, some of this has, a, has the kind of impact that we all hope it does. Do you expect that China is actually going to be able to enact any kind of influence here, or uh, is this just sort of ceremonious? I, I, I mean, we'll see, but I've always thought that uh, the idea that our administration, the Trump administration, engages China and, and urges them to get more involved and, and, to, and to keep control of this. Uh, you know, exert some influence on North Korea. I've always thought that was a, a smart move and the right move. Uh, again, we'll, we'll just have to see. All right, Congressman, good to have you here. Thank you very much. You bet. Take care. All right, Thanks. let's uh, talk about that other investigation. Is a grand jury in D.C. going to give President Trump a fair shake? Why Alan Dershowitz has some serious doubts he's here. And later outrage as a voter tells this GOP lawmaker to die in pain. First on Fox. That lawmaker. Let's go to New Jersey right now. You're looking at a live picture uh, where uh, members of the administration have been gathered there to address the opioid crisis. We are anticipating that Kellyanne Conway is going to come to that podium momentarily, and we're going to listen for you to see if she has anything to say on North Korea. And if she does, we're going to go straight to it because obviously North Korea, a dominant story today. Again, we're waiting on Kellyanne Conway. Fox News correspondent Laura Ingle is in New Jersey uh, where. Uh, all of this is taking place, and uh, some of these meetings just wrapped up uh, between the president uh, and others. Uh, fill us in, Laura. Hi, Trish. Well, indeed, you know, there's been a lot of a lot of excitement earlier today as we we're waiting for President Trump to begin this opioid conference, this roundtable meeting. Everybody wanting to know if he was going to have something to say about the situation that has been unfolding today with North Korea. And if body language and tone tells us anything, that was setting the stage for what he was about to say on the issue. Take a listen. North Korea best not make any more threats to the United States. They will be met with fire and fury like the world has never seen. He has been very threatening uh, beyond a normal statement. And as I said, they will be met with fire, fury, and frankly, power 
the likes of which this world has never seen before. And that comment came after a reporter teed up the question for him on North Korea. Then he got down to the business of what he was there to do, to discuss the opioid crisis happening in America. President Trump uh, continued on that, quoting the staggering statistics uh, that has ravaged so many Americans, who he described as young, old, rich, poor, and in urban and rural communities, adding, it's his greatest responsibility to protect the American people and to secure their safety, especially in some parts of the country country at